Have these lights in this camera just been left on this whole time? That can't be good. Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now I'm geeking out over the further adventures of Walt's frozen head. Dave's obsession. Dave's obsession of the moment. My friends and I recently had the pleasure of watching the further adventures of Walt's frozen head and chatting with its writer and director, Benjamin Lancaster. The film was shot in Orlando, Florida, partially on location in the Magic Kingdom, and it tells the story of Peter, a cast member who discovers Walt Disney's preserved head and gives him a tour of the Magic Kingdom while trying to reconnect with his daughter. The film built up hype thanks to its social media presence, the casting of theme park legend Ron Schneider as Walt, and of course its gimmick of secretly shooting on location at Disney World. And while the film doesn't over-rely on this gimmick, only featuring a handful of sequences actually shot in the park, it does make much better use of this gimmick than we've come to expect from this sub-sub-sub-sub-sub-genre. When certain other guerrilla filmmakers shot movies at Disney World that were being way, 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 way overhyped, most of the discourse was around the legal questions, because Disney still hasn't lived down that one time they sued that daycare in the Eisner days, even though they haven't done anything nearly that cruel to protect their IP since. Oh, don't get me wrong, they've acquired way too much IP, and they've ensured that they will always, always, always own that IP, but it's been several decades since they've bullied a preschooler. Anyway, the discourse eventually decided that since the movie was commenting on Disney, it's protected by the Fair Use Fairy. I didn't have time to make a graphic or get somebody to cameo as the Fair Use Fairy, but I called dibs on the Fair Use Fairy as a side character. The discourse kind of ignored the fact that Fair Use isn't really a hard and fast rule that can be cited as a preventative measure, but is instead more of a vague, amorphous defense whose validity is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. But the point is, everyone figured this movie was safe because it was making a statement about Disney World. Problem is, then the movie came out and it didn't really make a statement about Disney World, other than Disney World is a terrible place to take your family if you already hate your family. But The Further Adventures of Walt's Frozen Head does have something to say about Disney. And just as importantly, it has something to say about life, and Disney is the perfect backdrop for that statement. This is a movie about nostalgia. A movie about cherishing the past, but knowing when to let go of the past. And I can think of no better backdrop for that subject than the Disney parks, a subject that intrinsically has more than its fair share of baggage when it comes to accepting change. The image of Walt Disney is an image full of contradictions. The man's legacy is a blend of nostalgia and progressivism. He spearheaded new technologies in service of a park that actually forces you to walk through his own childhood. Keep moving forward, he said, while everyone after him kept looking backwards at what he would have done. And as a result, debates about what Walt would have wanted tend to get heated on a level reserved for debates about what Jesus would do. And film depictions of Walt tend to portray him pretty similarly to film depictions of Jesus. This movie provides a portrayal of Walt that's recognizable to his carefully crafted public persona, but still goes deeper into what made him tick than his biggest fans or the company named after him ever seemed to be comfortable doing. As a result, The Further Adventures of Walt's Frozen Head is not only better than certain other shot at Disney World movies, but despite being a completely fictional sci-fi fantasy comedy, it's also better than most other Walt Disney biopics. I realize I keep giving this movie very low bars to clear, but it's not the movie's fault that it's better than anything else you can compare it to. This movie is, in part, a character study of Walt Disney, insofar as Walt's personality ties into the broader themes. It starts with a lot of those fun facts we know about Walt, such as the better-known anecdotes from his life. When Diane was about six, she came to me and asked if I was Walt Disney. I said, yes I am. Then she asked if I was THE Walt Disney. Oh, and don't even get the movie started on Walt's love of trains. What does a caboose even do? I don't know, but you gotta have one. A caboose holds the rail crew that does the track switching. Modern railroads have computerized systems, so they don't need one. But it's not just about service-level, fan service shoutouts. shout-outs. The film goes deeper into exploring the type of person who would spearhead new technology for the explicit purpose of holding on to the past. So now anyone who wants to go to Disney World has to walk through your little town to get there. I wish they could do more than that. I wish they could grow up on a Missouri farm, struggle to start a business, then chuck it all and head west with nothing but $40 and a can of film. And the movie pairs Walt with Peter, somebody who only moves forward for the sake of holding on to his daughter's childhood. Right. Whatever makes her happy, right? You came back. Executive. Six-figure salary. Yours. 
Peter spends most of the movie trying to chase after his daughter's childhood, either going after a specific toy she used to have, or preventing her from going on a big trip, or just trying to spend time with her at the Magic Kingdom, just like they did when she was a kid. And Peter and Walt's arcs inform each other, and they both learn from each other to get to a place that they probably both should have arrived at a long time ago. And Peter and Walt make for a fantastic duo. They are so delightful to watch together. Not only very well written, but just Daniel Cooksley and Ron Schneider have such great chemistry that it really is hard to believe that they never actually met during the course of filming this movie. <laughs> And the film comes to the conclusion that you should know when to let go of the past, but that doesn't mean forgetting the past entirely. Nostalgia can still be a joyful and healthy thing, in moderation, and this film knows just how to use its nostalgia for maximum effect. This film is not shy with its love for Disney. When we talked to Ben, he cited the Disney comedies of the 60s as the primary inspiration for the style of the film. From the very early beginning, I knew that I wanted this movie to feel like the 1960s comedies that the Disney company made. Mm. And so, from the script level, from the aesthetic level, um, even uh, parts of the production design, we were really molded around the absent-minded professor, Blackbeard's ghost, those kind of comedies that really influenced the framing of shots, both in the park and then outside of that. This influence is even more apparent in some of the bonus features, such as the Disney sing-along songs version of the park montage seen on the film's YouTube channel. But despite the film's love for Disney, it's also willing to critique Walt and the Disney culture and even some of the fan base. Not the blind hatred of certain other precursors, but a more nuanced acknowledgement of some of the less favorable aspects of the subject matter. I really think we should talk to the Union about this. Union? We took a vote. Well, all the head carriers decided to join the cranium bearers, Local 23. That's really not funny. Well, I guess I should take a page from the movie's book and find something to criticize about the movie itself. Um, uh, hey, uh, this guy is supposed to be Bob Iger, but I think this guy looks a lot more like Bob Iger, so you should have cast him as this guy instead. Yeah. That's all I got. I like this movie a lot. The film doesn't rely on the in-park sequences because this film has more to offer than just a gimmick. It's a story that would still work even if they did have permission to film in the parks, or to a lesser extent if the film was set in a fictional park. This doesn't need to be Disney World, but Disney World does help tell this story. But while the filmmakers don't over-rely on the in-park gimmick, they do make the most of their time in the park, and they even get some added symbolism from the attractions themselves. Everything has a purpose, unlike other films that I hate to keep comparing this film to, but I can't stress enough how low it set my expectations. And sure, the in-park sequences are a relatively small portion of the film, but they do throw in a bonus visit to another theme park that I know far too well. Oh, you've got to be kidding. If you watch my channel, you're probably a Disney Park fan yourself, or someone who just enjoys watching Disney Park fans geek out, so The Further Adventures of Walt's Frozen Head is probably right up your alley. But even if you're not a Disney Park fan, it's still a perfectly charming movie that's fun for the whole family. So check it out and follow Walt's Frozen Head on Twitter. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off.